Now, the Metropolitan Police say that it will now take the lead in investigating sex abuse allegations against the late Sir Jimmy Savile as more women come forward claiming to have been assaulted by the television presenter. As the BBC continue to deny that they had any knowledge of the alleged assaults, a former press officer for the corporation has admitted that the controller of Radio 1 asked him to look into abuse rumours in the 1970s. It comes as new audio has emerged in which Jimmy Savile appears to be behaving inappropriately with a young girl. Some viewers may find parts of Porica Brand's report distressing. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Top of the Pop. Let's count down some of the facts surrounding the Jimmy Savile scandal and look at what it means for the BBC. At number five, at least ten women have now come forward, either to police or in the media. Three police forces are looking into it, including Sussex and Northamptonshire. But in the last hour, the Met Police have announced that their serious case team will take the national lead looking at these complaints. At number four, audio has emerged from archives of a BBC Radio 1 recording of Savile's travels from 1975. It would have been normal for a BBC sound recordist and producer to have been present. We don't know whether it was broadcast. We don't know who the young girl is. Who's your best pal, tell me. Oh, I'll tell you. No, Desmond. He's not. He is. No, he's not. Get off me. Because he's a married man. Don't care. Yes, you do. Get off. I won't. Not oh, until... you're just squatting. <laughs> not until you say me. Me. So I promise. I promise. That you, Jimmy Savile. <laughs> you, Jimmy Savile. Are the only one. Are the only one. In my life. No, you're not the only one in my life. And Noel Edmonds and all their mothers is definitely one. Ooh. Get off. Who's your best pal? <laughs> you as a pal. Get off my backside. Eh? I beg your pardon. In front of your mummy and daddy. <coughs> Goodness gracious. Although the context is unclear, against the backdrop of what's happening, it is at the very least enlightening. At number three, a raft of former BBC presenters and producers have come out of the woodwork to say his behaviour was an open secret. But did those further up the corporate food chain know? In the 70s, Radio 1 controller, the late Douglas Muggeridge, asked a press officer to find out whether the tabloids were looking into the rumours. He was told they weren't, and it ended there. As an organisation, they probably didn't, but certain people must have been aware of rumours. And now the BBC has to fight the possibility that things actually took place on their premises. And I would think horrified would be the right way of describing it, yes. At number two, this evening mixed messages at the BBC. A senior executive has said there's no reason now why parts of the original Newsnight investigation into Savile can't be made available, which we understand came as a surprise to many in the corporation. Finally, at number one. No concrete evidence has emerged of any sort of cover-up at the BBC. The question remains, though, if it was an open secret, why, for so long, did it stay as just a secret? Porrick O'Brien. Earlier I spoke to the BBC's Director of Editorial Policy and Standards, David Jordan. What did he make of the audio recording alleged to be of Jimmy Savile talking to a girl in an extremely unpleasant manner? Yeah, it's very difficult for me to comment on that, John, because that's not a piece of tape which I even know I know the provenance of, and I don't even know whether it's whether it was part of a BBC programme or, or whether it wasn't or it was recorded in some other circumstances. What, what I can say is is the BBC has been pretty horrified and appalled by by the the testimony of some of the women who appeared in the ITV documentary last night and what they had to say about what they suffered at the at the hands of Jimmy Savile and we're we're very keen that that uh, as much evidence of what actually went on and and uh, that people who have evidence of what actually went on should come forward and give it to the police give it to the BBC who will pass it on to the police so that there can be the the fullest possible investigation into what Jimmy Savile was or was not doing during his time at the BBC and uh, on BBC premises. A good bit of that time was spent on Radio 1 and um, we have spoken to Rodney Collins who was a PR at the time at the BBC who was asked by Douglas Moggridge who was controller of Radio 1 then uh, to uh, check up uh, to see whether a story which suggested that Jimmy Savile was uh, not up to 
uh, was up to some pretty bad stuff to see if any of it was going to be published. Does that ring any bells with you? Well, it doesn't ring any bells in the sense that I don't know any more about that than, than you do from having read newspaper accounts of it recently. But what's quite clear is that over the period of Jimmy Savile's employment at the BBC and during his other activities, there were rumours about Jimmy Savile. The problem seems to be that, that certainly from the BBC's trawl of its records, we can find no evidence that hard allegations were made or hard evidence were offered against him. That this, this was actually part of the difficulty the BBC had. They'd built Jimmy Savile up into a massive brand. They were party to the good Jimmy Savile, and really the last thing they wanted on earth was the bad Jimmy Savile. Uh, and this, this surely comes to a head right there uh, in the last few months when you have that collision between wanting to stole uh, Jimmy Savile in that uh, Jim will fix it special after he died and Newsnight's determination to try and expose him. Well, I've not known any manager at the BBC who, however big the star, would have been prepared to tolerate the kind of behaviour which we now have alleged against Sir Jimmy Savile and which there's really significant evidence suggest he was guilty of. Well, let's turn then to your investigations that are going on now. What are they? Well, what we've done is to make available our investigations unit at the BBC to help the police in any inquiries they can make. What is what that? That's a gr group of journalists, is Going it? on to the BBC. Is that a group of no, journalists no, that's or a, what? That's a, no, no, that's a group of mainly former ex-policemen, actually, who work in the BBC investigating things on behalf of the BBC. So they're empowered to help the police in any way that they can to investigate the allegations that we made about Jimmy Savile and any other allegations that they want investigated. Do you think part of the problem is that there was a different culture in the 1970s and that, that people were more permissive about uh, uh, young people than, than nowadays and people understand paedophilia and child molestation much better now? I, I certainly do think there was a different culture in, in, in that era in the 60s and 70s in relation to child protection and I certainly do think that thanks to the efforts like people, people like Esther Ransom and so on that we have consider, considerably stepped up the way in which we deal with child protection in, in all of, of our lives, but in broadcasting and in the BBC just as much as anywhere else. There was a different culture, but I don't recollect a culture in which it was acceptable for a 30 or 40 year old man to push a, a young woman aged 14 or 15 up against a wall and sexually molest her. I don't think that was acceptable at any time in the past or in the present. But you're prepared to accept that it happened? Well, the testimony of the women who said that this happened, I think, was very powerful, and I have absolutely no reason to disbelieve them. And are you not distressed, therefore, that a BBC programme who got almost exactly the same testimony didn't end up running it? Well, as I say, that's a decision that was made by the editor and the news. Well, it's a pretty terrible decision, wanted, isn't it? If the, if, the testimony, well, if the testimony shocks you on ITV, it's surely pretty bad that it wasn't allowed to shock people on the BBC. Well, I'm sure other editors, other people might have made different decisions. You or I, John, might have made a different decision, but an editor makes an honest decision. These are tough decisions that editors have to make whether to pursue investigations, and I'm sure that the decision that was made was an honest one and made with all the circumstances in mind. And, and you know, none of us who weren't there at the time can know what all of those were and what all the facts were at his disposal. Uh, David Jones of the BBC.